The Beatles were an English rock band that formed in Liverpool in 1960. With John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison, and Ringo Starr, they became widely regarded as the greatest and most influential act of the rock era. Rooted in skiffle, beat, and 1950s rock and roll, the Beatles later experimented with several genres, ranging from pop ballads to psychedelic and hard rock, often incorporating classical elements in innovative ways. The story begins in Liverpool on the 6th of July in 1957, a pivotal day for the history of modern music. It was the day that John Lennon met Paul McCartney for the very first time. In the afternoon, the Quarryman Skiffle Group played at the Garden Fate of St. Peter's Church in Woolton, Liverpool. The performance took place on a stage in a field behind the church. The group arrived on the back of a lorry. As well as music, there were craft and cake stalls, games of hoopla, police dog demonstrations, and the traditional crowning of the Rose Queen. We're here on this rather grey day in the grounds of St. Peter's Church, Woolton, where on the 6th of July 1957, John Lennon met Paul McCartney. John's group, the Quarrymen, were playing at the annual Garden Fete, the fundraising event of the church, on that afternoon, when Paul McCartney was in the audience, having been brought here by their mutual friend, Ivan Vaughan. Ivan lived near John Lennon, but went to school with Paul, so he knew them both. In Paul, Ivan saw someone who could play a guitar like a guitar. John at that stage was playing his like a banjo. Paul could tune a guitar, not John. And Paul could remember all the words of all the songs, whereas John ad-libbed. After the garden fete, the group moved over to the church hall just across the road, where John and Paul talked at length, and John realized that Paul would be good for his group. But he felt threatened with this good-looking boy, better equipped musically, so John did nothing. But after about 10 days, he came to his senses, and he then sent a message to Paul to come and join the group. So this is where, in my mind, it all began. John meeting Paul. This imposing sandstone church behind me may seem an unlikely place to stop on our journey through the Beatles' history. But it was here, on the 6th of July, 1957, that a young Paul McCartney was brought to see the Quarrymen, John Lennon's skiffle group. In a field behind this church, Paul saw the young John Lennon play for the first time and was very impressed, even though John forgot many of the words to the 50s songs he was singing and had to improvise. If you look around this graveyard, you'll find the occasional inspirational clue to the Beatles' presence. Eleanor Rigby's gravestone, Father Mackenzie, all lying in front of the church where the wedding had been. Ken Rawlinson, you're the caretaker of St. Peter's Church. I am, yes. Can you tell us about the Beatles' connection with this church? Well, 40 odd years ago, the Beatles played here as a skiffle group uh, on the field at the back in the daytime and in the big church hall in the evening. And this is where John and Paul first met? It is, yes. I believe that there are in the graveyard there are some other Beatles connections. Yes, we have Eleanor Rigby's grave from the song, of course. Um, and we think Father Mackenzie may have been from the Catholic Church next door. Right. So quite a strong part of Beatles history. Yes, oh yes, yes. And I believe you uh, recently uh, commemorated the 40th anniversary of John and Paul's meeting. We did, that was last year, and we repeated the whole fair day and uh, got together the old um, crowd, the, the uh, quarry men as they were, and they played again on the field in the afternoon and in the evening in the hall as a skiffle group. And I've heard there was a story about some aircraft that flew over. Yes, uh, two planes came over, two small planes, and we thought it was um, Yoko and Paul who could have been in them, just to have a look at the day. And they sent their uh, their best wishes to they you, did. I believe. They, they sent us letters uh, wishing us the best for the day and so on, yes. So this must be something of a mecca mm. for Beatles fans. Do you get a lot of tourists? We here? do, yes, yes, many tourists from all over the world, in fact, yes. Right. Well, thank you very much, Ken. Right, fine. Hi, and welcome to the most famous nightclub in the world, the Cavern, Liverpool. 
where on the 5th of February 1961, four young Liverpool lads took to that stage and started a musical sensation that would rock the world. The Cavern opened as a jazz club in 1957, and the Beatles played here 292 times. As their popularity grew, so did their audiences, until eventually so many Liverpool teenagers crowded into this tiny room to see their heroes play that the sweat from their bodies caused condensation to drip from the ceiling and land on the Beatles' instruments, fusing their amplifiers. You could say it was a truly electrifying atmosphere. Traditional jazz was no longer the big draw. Skiffle had won the fight for a hearing. But these were national trends, too conventional for Liverpool youth. Something new was wanted, and out of the cavern there emerged a new sound. A few chords strung together on a cheap guitar, a drum for a beat, another guitar, more chords, a bass to give balance. The Mersey beat came firm from the mold. By 1960, beat groups were billed as big attractions. The young generation would listen to little else. New jazz clubs opened overnight. And as the new jazz clubs opened overnight, so the new beat groups came into being. Every facility for the formation of these groups was ready to hand. The cavern had opened earlier in the year, on the 17th of January. It was primarily a jazz club, which played host to occasional evening skiffle sessions. The cavern club would become a regular venue for Beatles shows, while they remained a Liverpool secret. Once Beatlemania took hold, however, they rarely played in their home city again. The 7th of August in 1957 is commonly believed to be the first date the Quarrymen played at the soon-to-be legendary venue. The other acts on the bill were Ron McKay's Skiffle Group, Darktown Skiffle Group, and the Deltones Skiffle Group. The Cavern Club was owned by Alan Seitner, who played at the same golf club as the Quarrymen's manager, John Lennon's school girlfriend, Nigel Wally. It was through this connection that the nascent band got their first show at the venue. Seitner had heard the group perform at the Childwall Golf Club. However, the Quarrymen set didn't go down well. They began with Come Go With Me, followed by Hound Dog and Blue Suede Shoes. Although a member of the Quarrymen at this time, Paul McCartney was away at scout camp on this day, and so he did not play. Liverpudlian promoter Charlie Mac McBain held regular skiffle and rock events at his venues. On Friday, the 18th of October in 1957, he ran one such event at the new Clubmore Hall in Norris Green, Liverpool. It was the first show in which Paul McCartney appeared on stage with the Quarrymen. McCartney played lead guitar. First night nerves, however, caused him to make a hash of his solo during the Quarrymen's version of Arthur Smith's 1946 instrumental hit, Guitar Boogie. McCartney's debut with the Quarrymen was a significant occasion in the development of the group. For the promoter, however, they made little solid impression. Charlie Mack's recorded verdict on the group was a scribbled good and bad on the Quarrymen's visiting card. By December 17, 1957, the Quarrymen played Wilson Hall in Liverpool. This was the Quarrymen's second of four performances at Wilson Hall in Liverpool's Garston district one of the venues run by local promoter Charlie Mac McBain. It's believed that this may have been the first time George Harrison saw the group perform, but this is not certain. It's more likely he first saw them at Wilson Hall on February 6 in 1958, although he may have met them elsewhere before then. The venue was situated opposite the Garston Bus Depot and had been built by Francis Wilson. It was a somewhat rough venue favored by local gangs of teddy boys. The Quarrymen's other performances at Wilson Hall were on Thursdays. This was their only Saturday night booking there. The Quarrymen's first live engagement of 1958 was their third at the new Clubmore Hall, a conservative club in Liverpool's Norris Green district. They had originally been due to play a dance on the previous night at Wilson Hall in Garston, but promoter Charlie Mac McBain changed the booking. Well, when I first became involved with Beatles, say, uh, it was Pete Best, not Ringo. And they were all sort of individuals, like um, 
Pete attracted uh, a lot of screaming girls um, for his looks. It didn't matter if he had talent or not. Um, he did, I'm not saying he didn't, but it didn't matter because they would, uh, you know, look up to Peter's. Uh, he was a very, very good looking young man. So I knew Pete, he was a very nice fellow, very quiet. Kept himself very much to himself, although he did enjoy the attention of the girls. Um, George was also quite quiet, although he did join in bits of the, the fun and the performance you know, the, the other two used to call. George was a very quiet, um, and I've been saying this for years, but through his recent passing away, um, it's become more known. And uh, but he, he, I, I always knew George as a very quiet, spoken uh, introvert, if you like, but knew how to play his instrument and knew his music. Um, Paul was, in my mind, in my memory of Paul, still does really, uh, quite Americanized. Paul was always the keen one. He was always the one that wanted to do things and check the mics and uh, what was the club like and, you know, even down to security. He was always the one that went past the actual show itself. Um, I remember one night, well, one day, we um, we all got drunk. Well, I should, I'm going out of turn, out of chronological order, really. Uh, I'll come back to that in a minute. So Paul was the one who was the key. He was the sort of, you could say, the um, head of the group. John was the, the voice, and then John's voice, I still say it's the best voice in rock and roll, you know. Uh, very, very distinguish, distinguishable. Um, he just loved rock and roll. He wasn't interested in the, he was, didn't even care how much they got paid, John. He was just doing it for fun. And they called John Lennon the singing rage. And I thought, well, the singing rage, well, you know, there's a lot of the Elvis was the rage, Cliff Richard was a rage, you know, uh, or the, the rage at the time. But I realized it, it was a double meaning because he was the rage of the cabin, but he sang, every, every song he sang, he sang in a rage, you know. On the 15th of July, John Lennon's mother, Julia, dies. From 1946, John had lived with his Aunt Mimi, Mary Smith, and Uncle George in their house, Mendips, at 251 Menlove Avenue in Liverpool, after Julia had handed over care of her son to them. Despite the living arrangements, Julia came to see John almost every day. In 1958, she bought him his first guitar, a cheap Galatone champion acoustic guaranteed not to split. Julia shared John's love of rock and roll music. Julia's death deeply traumatized John, who would later refer to her in the songs Julia, Mother, and My Mummy's Dead. His first son, Julian, was named after her. Although the Quarrymen had few formal engagements between March 1958 and the end of the year, they did perform a few times at parties and family events. On the 20th of December in 1958, they played at the wedding reception of George Harrison's brother, Harry, and his bride, Irene McCann. The event was held in Speak, Liverpool. Saturday, August 29th in 1959 was the opening night of the Casbah Coffee Club, a new social club for teenagers based in the cellar of a large Victorian house at 8 Haymans Green in Liverpool. The Casbah Coffee Club was run by Mona Best, mother of one Pete Best and owner of the house. She had bought it after winning a horse racing bet in the 1954 Epsom Derby. It had previously been owned by the West Derby Conservative Club and had 15 bedrooms and an acre of land. It's a good idea to let people know about the Casbah because they know about the cavern. They know about some of those things, but the Casbah was like the um, place where all that started. It was actually before the cavern, all of that. And we had a more intimate relationship with it. It was almost our club. You used to have this, you know, people upstairs, uh, Rory's friends, my friends downstairs, you know, in the living room. And Mo basically turned around and said, because there used to be constant traffic up and down the stairs, and she's trying to decorate the place, and, you know, carpet layers are in, trying to lay carpet and all the rest of it. She went, look, guys, you know, 
There's one den upstairs. There's one den you've taken over in the living room. There's cellars downstairs. You know, why don't you go downstairs? Do what you want. You know, lose yourself, make as much noise as you want down there. And just get on with it. Mo again, um, come with me to the Casbah. She got the idea from an old Charles Boye film called Algiers, in which there was a scene uh, where they actually say, come with me to the Casbah. And that stuck in Mo's mind. And from then on, it was, uh, come with me to the Casbah. And consequently, as this work was going on, you know, more people were knocking at the door. And the membership was starting to grow a little bit. Uh, till the fateful day, you know, over to 29th, 1959, and the, the doors opened to the Casbah. It was a fantastic night. We were built as a quarry man. And uh, it was like we got together, and, and uh, I think Mo said, Oh, have you got a name for the group? And John said, Well, I used to have a band called the Quarry Men, like, you know, use that name if you like. I wasn't worried because we was just glad we got a band, you know, for Mo. I remember the Casbah night, the opening night, because uh, we were upstairs in this house in West Derby, which I didn't know a lot about obviously, because I wasn't in the museo's business or anything else, but I was with John and Paul. And I think when we went downstairs, and the whole setup was, was wonderful for an aspiring young rock and roller to have that on their doorstep and to be able to sort of perform um, safely. I don't know how, how to put it. It was safe and it was secure. And the crowd had already started to gather outside. And uh, remember Rory putting Red River Rock on, which became basically the in-house song for the Casbah. Um, and it started, and the doors opened. I mean, it was me, John, George, and Ken. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Of course, Apple Blossom time. Well, who was drumming then? There wasn't a drummer. No, that was it, because that would that, fit in, because we used to show up at gigs, those early gigs, and the promoter would say, where's your drummer? We say the rhythm's in the guitars and just hold your nerve while he just <laughs> panicked a bit. Just hope, hope he bought it, you know. So that would have been in that stage, yeah, the rhythm was in the guitars. I remember the first group I saw there, which weren't, they weren't really a group at the time, right, were the Beatles, but it was like John and Paul and uh, some guy called Ken Brown, I think, maybe George, I know uh, Sin, Lennon was sitting there as well. So we opened with that, you know, and they came up, you know, and by the time we got on the stage, or on the stage, you know, up here, like, that is, we want the quality men, we want the quality men, you know. Well, that was like the prelude to it all, really. You know, getting to know each other, getting the vibe of a club, just getting the feel of all of that. It's our gentleman's club. <laughs> we didn't go to Boodles, we went to the Casper. 1959 was not too eventful for the quarrymen though they did enter the TV Search for a Star competition. The Quarrymen had entered the competition two years previously without success. John Lennon, Paul McCartney, and George Harrison returned to Liverpool's Empire Theatre for another preliminary audition. One problem that they did have was that the group did not have a drummer, since Colin Hanton walked out of the Quarrymen on the 1st of January in 1959. Perhaps in a bid to differentiate themselves from their recent lineup with Ken Brown, the group renamed themselves Johnny and the Moondogs for this event. The auditions were held by Mr. Starmaker Carol Levis at Liverpool's Empire Theatre over three consecutive Saturdays on the 11th, 18th, and 25th of October. While it is unclear on which date Johnny and the Moondogs appeared, the 18th of October is the most likely. The group successfully passed the audition, qualifying for the regional finals on the 15th of November. The group had much writing on their appearance, which was held at the New Manchester Hippodrome Theatre in Ardwick, Manchester. It would guarantee them a television appearance and resulting fame. Voting in the contest was based on a clapometer, registering audience applause. Johnny and the Moondogs lacked the local support they enjoyed in Liverpool, and anyway, couldn't have made much of an impact. Liking a place to stay in Manchester, they caught the train back home by the time the audience was required to cast its judgment. 1960 didn't start too well for the Beatles. 
Lennon, McCartney, and Harrison had ditched the Quarrymen and decided to take the name the Silver Beatles. On Tuesday, the 10th of May, at the Blue Angel Club, London-based music promoter Larry Parnes traveled to Liverpool to audition groups to back Billy Fury on a tour of Northern England and Scotland. The audition took place at the Blue Angel, a club run by the Silver Beatles' new manager, Alan Williams. The venue was previously known at the Wyvern Social Club and was located at 106 to 108 Seal Street in Liverpool. The auditions were filled with several hopeful Liverpool acts, among them Cass and the Casanovas, Derry and the Seniors, Jerry and the Pacemakers, Cliff Roberts and the Rockers, and the Silver Beetles. I first met the Beatles right here, and not right exactly where I'm sitting now, but in this club which was known as the Jacaranda Coffee Bar Club. And uh, I first encountered them because they went to the art college just up the road, which is virtually five minutes from here. And Stuart and uh, John Lennon, they used to skip the lectures because they were interested in rock and roll music. And I used to let all the groups play, like the big three, Rory Storm and the Hurricanes, Jerry and the Pacemakers. I used to let them rehearse free in the basement because it was doing nothing in the, uh, in the daytime. And then I got to know them as coffee bar layabouts, to be honest with you. And uh, the first time I ever really paid them any money was to decorate uh, this club. The paintings are, some of the paintings have still lasted behind me now. And so uh, that's how I really got to know them. And then uh, the second stage was when I uh, did, I was a promoter as well in those days. And I put a concert on at the local boxing stadium. <clears throat> and the lineup was uh, Eddie Cochran, late Eddie Cochran, Gene Vincent, and Larry Pons, who was the big uh, empresario of, of the day. And uh, I don't know whether you know, but Eddie Cochran died in a car accident uh, virtually two weeks before the show. And I had the option to pull out or uh, to go on with Gene Vincent. Because Gene Vincent, though he was in the accident, he was uh, virtually unhurt. So uh, I decided to go on with the show. And I thought, what a good chance uh, to show off the Liverpool groups. So to make up for Eddie Cochran, I put about five Liverpool bands on. And uh, the show went off great. And afterwards, we all came back to the Jacaranda, uh, you know, just to have coffee, because we weren't licensed in those days. So it was an unlicensed club, as it were. And Larry Pons was so impressed with the Liverpool groups, he wanted to give them some work. Now, unknown to me, the Beatles were listening to our conversation. And then when I came into the Jack the next day, uh, John and Stuart appro uh, approached me and said, hey, Al, uh, when are you going to do something for us like? And I thought, there's no more painting to be done. You painted the ladies' toilets, you painted the basement. And then they told me they had a group. And uh, by that time, I'd got to know them quite well, because uh, I put on a big arts ball and they built the floats for me. And then uh, I said, well, well what, what do you call yourself and where do you play? And they gave me the lineup, which was obvious that they didn't have a drummer. And then I said, well, we've got to get you a drummer. He said, well, we're managing so far without one. And, uh, so then I said, I'll ask one of the groups if he, can, if he knows a drummer. So I called uh, one of the big three over, and I said, look, these are a group and they've got a drummer. Can you recommend anybody? And he said, yeah, we do know one, a guy called Tommy Moore. And he said, what do you call yourself, lads? And John said, uh, oh, we call ourselves the Beatles. He said, you'll never get anywhere with a stupid name like that. I became... Uh, the manager and then Larry Pons phoned me up this is the next stage as it were and because he was so impressed with the Liverpool groups which I put on at the stadium he asked me to hold auditions because one of his uh, pop stars was a guy called Billy Fury who's tragically dead now 
and he being from Liverpool uh, would have liked to have a, a Liverpool group to back him and so we all uh, went to another club which I was just about to open called the Blue Angel and I thought well I'll throw the Beatles in now to me they were sort of rough but good enough and to my surprise uh, they got the job um, Billy Fury said yes we would like uh, that group the Beatles but they spotted that Stuart Sutcliffe who was John Lennon's best friend could hardly play the bass and they said but without the bass player and the reason they gave was that uh, they couldn't afford five musicians and so Stuart would have to go and to my surprise John said no we're not doing it if Stu doesn't go with the band uh, we don't want to do it and it was a job that any group in Liverpool would have given their right arm to have you know been the backing group of one of the best pop singers in the in the late 50s I used to have a steel band that used to play in the jack around they used to play in the corner over there uh, we had no stage by the way <laughs> and it was only half the size of what it is now now they've knocked uh, the next door building and so if you could imagine it was known as the black hole of cold cutter in those days and i came down expecting steel band to be playing and there was no steel band and i said to one of the staff well where's the steel band and he said don't you know i said no i don't I wouldn't be asking would i and he said well they've gone to hamburg i said hamburg you know <laughs> never even heard of the place then and uh, so I thought, wow. So I put the Beatles in. So this is one of the first places that the Beatles ever played. And George, who was the, the baby of the group in those days, came up to see me and said, uh, do you have a mop and a brush, Alan? I said, yes. And uh, I was curious. And then when I went down, they were that impoverished that they actually tied the mics to the end of the brush and the mop and their girlfriends was holding them up one of them uh, was Cynthia Lennon who as you know married uh, John then I got a letter from uh, Hamburg from the uh, West Indian steel band by that time I'd, all, I'd, I'd managed to get another steel band and the letter saying Alan it's uh, really swinging over here with all the contacts and all the groups that you know why don't you come over here there's plenty of work here for groups so i thought yeah i'll do that so i auditioned not auditioned the groups that i wanted to go uh they all played down and we made a tape recording and in those days it was like a grundic tape machine you didn't have these little cassettes which you hold up now and you know it's a real to real job and so i took this tape and off i went to hamburg and uh, I was going in and out of clubs on the Reaper Band and the Grosse Freiheit. And then I hit upon a club which was called the Kaiser Keller. And I could hear rock and roll music coming from the basement. So down I went, and there was this awful German band singing Tutti Frutti with no rhythm and just Tutti Frutti, oh Rudy, Tutti Frutti, oh Rudy. And all the kids. Uh, weren't even dancing to them and then there came the pause which means the interval and they put the jukebox on next minute uh, they were all dancing to Cliff Richards and uh, other American artists and I hope this is it so I asked to see the manager and I was uh, shown into his office I had this reel to reel tape with me and I said have you ever considered having uh, English uh, live musicians over he brought out his tape recorder i put the tape on put it on pressed the buttons and waited for this glorious liverpool mersey beat sound instead all i got was <laughs> the tape somebody taped over uh the uh what they'd recorded because the tape so says you could tape on top of the tape and below you get two recordings out of the one tape but somebody had taped in the middle and ruined it. And I said, yeah, um, your tape recorder kaput? Nine, and he put his tape on, of course. I thought, I've blown it. 
back I came with my tail between my legs, as it were, back to Liverpool, told all the bands that they'd blown it. Somebody had made a cock up of the tapes. And then I completely sort of forgot it was just a, an interesting journey which went wrong. And then I was managing another group called um, Derry and Seniors, uh, who's the, the leader of that group was a guy called Howie Casey, who's quite well known in the musical business now. And they'd got work with Larry Pons to do a summer season. They'd all given up their jobs, bought uniforms, and on the 11th hour, Larry Pons cancelled the whole deal. So they'd all given up their jobs, and they blamed me. And I thought, well, what can I do to save this situation? And I remember there used to be a coffee bar club in, uh, in London called the Two Eyes. So I had a minibus, and we all went in the minibus. This was about a month after I'd been to uh, Hamburg. And we went down to the Two Eyes. I saw the guy who owned the place, uh, Tommy his name was, and I said, uh, I've got this livable group, do you mind if they play? Well, of course, he didn't mind. He was getting the top group playing for nothing. Most of the groups that came, uh, became famous also sort of were discovered in the Two Eyes coffee bar. It had that reputation. And so uh, the band setter was playing, and I, I saw this chap who I thought, I know his face. And he, he was looking at me, and then this young lad came over and said, are you anything to do with this band? I said, yes. He said, well, there's this German geezer here uh, reckons he knows you. And I said, here, kosh me there. And he said, ah, here, William is like Stanley and Livingstone sort of thing. And my first thought was to get him out of there because the guy who owned the coffee bar, uh, he uh, had his own bands as well. And so I took him to uh, a coffee bar across the road called Act One, Scene One. But he couldn't speak English. And so eventually we found a, a German waiter who worked in one of the coffee bars. And uh, he wanted, um, a German, uh, wanted an English band to play in his club. I said, well, why are you here? He said, well, I came a month ago. You told me your, your bands were good. But he'd never heard of Liverpool, so he automatically went to the capital, London. And of course, it didn't take him long. And he got a band called um, Tony Sheridan, uh, who played for him. And Tony Sheridan was a bit of a difficult person, that's putting it mildly, to get on with. And he left after two weeks and went to another club to play. And that meant Herr Koshmider had no band. So uh, I fixed him up with Howie Casey. So that was, they were the first group that went over was Howie Casey. And they became so uh, big over there and the business was booming. And he had another club called the Indra, which was a, a strip tease club. And he decided to turn that into a rock and roll uh, club. And I thought, well, the Beatles, they're good enough to go over there. And I asked them, I said, would you like to go to Hamburg? He said, yeah, sure, we'd all love to go. But then um, Tommy Moore, who was the drummer, who was a year, or he was about my age, actually. He was 10 years uh, older than John. And he, he wasn't very bright, poor fellow. And if you weren't very bright with John Lennon, you know, he, he had a scathing tongue, very sarcastic. Um, wicked sense of humor and Tommy couldn't take anymore so he left so we had another drummer Norman Chapman who was very good and he unfortunately we had national conscription in those days and he was called up uh, to do his army service so we lost him and I said well I'm afraid you can't go unless we can you know come up with a drummer and then they remembered that they used to play in a little club called the Cash Bar, uh, which was owned by uh, a Mrs. Best. And uh, they said, yeah, we've got this guy, uh, Pete Best, and we believe he's just bought a new set of drums. So we'll go and get him. So they got Pete Best. Pete Best auditioned right in this club here. And as far as I'm concerned, I couldn't care less whether he, he was a brilliant drummer or not, but he was a, a reasonable drummer and so he got the job 
and then it came to money to get him over there because the other band paid the train first down to um, oh, Folkestone or so, Dover, somewhere like that. And then they got the train all the way to uh, Hamburg. Beatles, no, they haven't got a penny between them. In actual fact, uh, it's just been, it's quite funny this, right? well I think it's funny. It was announced in the local paper this week that um, Paul McCartney is now officially a billionaire. And you're looking at somebody who, uh, the only billionaire, oh I know, who owes me money. Uh, because they borrowed 15 pounds, still got the IOU for it. Uh, they owe me 15 quid uh, because they had no uh, gear to go in and that. So I lent them the 15 and then they said, well, we can't afford to, uh, to pay for the boat and the train. And so I thought, well, I've got the minibus, uh, I'll drive you there. And so I said, OK, we'll all go in a minibus and it'll cost you 10 pounds each. I'll pay the fares and the boats and the food and everything and you pay it out of your wages. And so we went to Hamburg uh, with the coach. There were 10 of us in a little minibus and that included all their equipment. Could you imagine a whole group in one minibus with the speakers and everything? The speakers and the amplifiers were no bigger than that little attache case. So we went over to uh, Hamburg and we stopped at uh, Arnhem. We walked around Arnhem and they all went into this uh, musical shop which sold musical instruments. And we came out of the shop and they all went into bulk laughing. I said, well, you know, what, what's the joke? John Lennon pulls out a mouth, he'd only stolen a mouth organ from the shop and I thought, gee whiz, we're not even going to make Hamburg, we're all going to finish up in jail, you know. Now this was the first time he'd ever been abroad, so how the hell are we going to get to Hamburg when he's already was shoplifting, you know. Anyway, we got to Hamburg and uh, we were shown the club, uh, the Indra, and when we went in, there was, it was still a strip club in there. I could see them all drop. Oh my God, we're not backing a striptease artist, are we? Anyway, it was established that this was the last night. So we found them accommodation, or rather the club on there, which was the back of an old cinema. Uh, it must have been an old variety um, theatre, and the dressing rooms at the back were still there, of course. But. He hadn't even bothered to clean them. There was about an inch thick dust on the walls and just bunk beds, uh, no water. To get uh, washed, they had to wait till the cinema uh, had finished, you know, and then they'd rush to the toilets and get a wash in the public toilets in the cinema. But then the engagement was for three months, but they were doing that well that was extended for another two months. So they'd left Liverpool for seven months. So much so that when they came back to play in Liverpool, nobody really knew the Beatles because they'd only done a few gigs around the Liverpool area. A fellow called Bob Wooler uh, slotted them in at a place called Little and Town Hall because the group didn't turn up. And there was instant Beatles mania started on that very night. The bouncers, uh, thought there was a fight because all the girls froze. So, you know, seeing these uh, five lads all in their leather gear, all stomping about the stage, and they all rushed to the stage, and uh, the bouncers thought there was a fight, because that's what happens when there's a fight. Everybody rushes to see the fight, and it was the Beatles. And they used to think they were a, a German band because they were billed. Um, other promoters of them said, direct from Hamburg. And the girls used to say to Paul, wow, you speak very good English for a German group. They wanted to go back to Hamburg again because they loved Hamburg. But we had problems with uh, this Herr Koschmider. Uh, he had them arrested and they were deported from Germany. Uh, he accused them of setting fire to his cinema. Well, what, well all that happened was uh, when they were getting ready to go to Liverpool, um, Somebody struck a match and uh, it was like a board who went round and it just blackened the wall because it was so filthy, you know, the dust. 
And so getting them back the second time was tough. But I managed to get them back. And then I got a letter from John Lennon saying they weren't going to pay my commission, which they never paid last time anyway. But the, they claimed that the cost me there deducted from the wages, and that wasn't their fault. And so I wrote them a letter saying, you appear to be getting more than a little swell, swelled headed now. Remember, I was the only one who took an interest in you. I know you're getting quite famous now, uh, but I'll fix this, that you'll never ever work again. And that terminated my uh, relationship with them. Because <laughs> I'd just opened another club called the Blue Angel, which was absolutely swing, and I thought, I don't need this. Harass harassment from a Tutton Satney group. And that's how I come to finish with them. On August 6th, the Beatles asked Pete Best to be their drummer. With their Saturday night residency at the Gross Veneer Ballroom canceled due to local complaints, the Beatles had some time off. On this night, they went to Mona Best's Casbah Coffee Club, where they saw the Blackjacks playing. The group had Mona's son, Pete Best, playing a brand new drum kit. The Blackjacks were on the point of splitting up, so the Beatles suggested to Pete that he join them for their first trip to Hamburg. Best was interested in the proposal and agreed to audition for them on the following Friday. When they first started appearing at the Cavern Club, uh, there was a guy named Derry Wilkie who had been to Germany, to Hamburg. And he came home and he was walking along Duke Street and he heard the Beatles practicing in the basement of the Jacaranda. And he recognized them as the Beatles because he'd been to see them a few times before he went up to Germany. And he banged on the, the ground for somebody to come up and open the door for him. And it was Paul McCartney. And of course, Paul knew Derry and various other people like they all know each other or knew each other. Um, and he said, listen, man, he said, you know, uh, I've just come back from Germany, from Hamburg. It's fantastic over there. He said, I want you to, you should get in touch. He said, and here's a phone number for you. And he passed on the phone number of the um, Kaiser Keller in Hamburg. And he said, if you phone there, you are asked for um, Mr. Kosh, Koshmider, I think his name was, Koshmider or Mider, um, and tell him the you know me, and I would highly recommend you. Yeah, there's these uh, four guys, as I say, that uh, most of us have not seen before. And uh, they were Stuart Suckler, uh, John, Paul, and George. Uh, their drummer evidently uh, couldn't be there because he had a, a day job. Uh, so anyway, we all went on, did our, our bit for Larry Pons, and Billy Fury was there, sitting there was watching the various bands and uh, each band went on in turn and then eventually came down to uh, this band called the Silver Beatles to do their thing you know and they got up and they borrowed the drummer from the big three a guy called Johnny Hutchison who's one of Liverpool's famous drummers at the time you know and they did their thing and funny enough uh, you know they're okay there's a little bit rough and ready and uh, but okay and um, I remember the, the bass player, Stuart, didn't face Larry Palms. He had his back to them. You know? And I, whether that was a moody or he was a bit ashamed of showing what he was doing on the bass, I don't know. The second major phase in the Beatles' story was about to begin. On the 16th of August in 1960, they embarked on the journey from Liverpool to Hamburg, Germany. The five members of the Beatles, John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison, Stuart Sutcliffe, and Pete Best, along with manager Alan Williams, his wife Beryl, her brother Barry Chang, and friend Lord Woodbine, set off from the Jacaranda Club in Williams Green Austin van. They stopped off in London to pick up a 10th passenger, Herr Steiner, an Austrian working in the Heaven and Hell coffee shop on Old Compton Street, who was to be the Hamburg promoter Bruno Koschmeider's interpreter. They then caught the ferry from Harwich to the Netherlands. The party ended up in Arnhem, after Williams took a wrong turn. While there, they were photographed at the War Memorial, spent time wandering around the city, 
and John Lennon stole a harmonica from a local shop. The Beatles arrived in Hamburg, Germany in the early evening of the 17th of August in 1960 for the first of 48 nights at the Indra Club on the Gross Fairheit Street. The group performed at the venue for 48 nights, ending on October 3rd in 1960. The venue was owned by Bruno Koschmeider, a local club owner who also owned the Kaiser Keller. The group's contract was to run for two months, from the 17th of August to October 16th. The Beatles were to receive 30 Deutschmarks, which is about two pounds 50 pence per person each day, paid every Thursday. Koshmeyer also paid their manager, Alan Williams, a commission of 10 pounds each week. They were expected to perform for four and a half hours each weekday night, from 8 to 9.30 p.m., 10 to 11 p.m., 11.30 p.m. to 12.30 a.m., and 1 a.m. to 2 a.m. They also had to play for six hours on Saturday. The Beatles spent much of December 1960 despondent and with no money, following the disastrous end to their first Hamburg trip. John Lennon was the last to arrive back in Britain but spent five days alone before finally contacting the other Beatles on the 15th of December. Paul McCartney, meanwhile, had taken a job in a Liverpool factory. The Beatles ended 1960 with a performance at the Casbah Coffee Club in Haman's Green, owned by drummer Pete Best's mother, Mona. This was the fourth and final time the Beatles played with stand-in bassist Chaz Newby, following Stuart Sutcliffe's decision to stay in Germany with Astrid Kircher. The Beatles played at the Casbah Coffee Club a total of 37 times between 1960 and 1962. The Beatles had given a triumphant homecoming performance at Litherland Town Hall on the 27th of December, 1960, following their first trip to Hamburg. They returned to the venue on this date for a second time. The night was promoted by Brian Kelly, whose BK events took place at halls across northern Liverpool. The Beatles performed at 36 BK engagements between this date and the 11th of March, 1961 several of which were booked immediately after their December show. This was the first time Paul McCartney played bass guitar with the Beatles, as Stuart Sutcliffe had chosen to stay in Hamburg with Astrid Kutcher. The Beatles were paid seven pounds, 10 pence for this appearance. In the audience were Johnny Guitar and Ringo Starr from Rory Storm and the Hurricanes, who had returned from Hamburg the day before. The Beatles played a total of 20 shows at Litherland Town Hall. The final one took place on the 9th of November, 1961. Thursday, February 9th, was the first time that the Beatles performed at the Cavern Club. Situated on Matthew Street in central Liverpool, the Cavern had played host to the Quarrymen before. On this day, however, the Beatles made their debut at the venue. The Beatles swiftly became a regular fixture at the Cavern, attracting a loyal audience until their final appearance on the 3rd of August, 1963. For this first show, Lasting from 1 to 2 p.m., they were given a five-pound fee to share between them. This was George Harrison's first time on the Cavern stage. Harrison arrived in blue jeans, which were banned from the club, but he managed to convince the bouncer, Paddy Delaney, that he was one of the performers. The precise number of the Beatles' Cavern performances is not known, although they played at least 155 lunchtime and 125 evening shows between this date and the 3rd of August, 1963. On Monday, the 15th of March in 1961, Stuart Sutcliffe had flown alone to Hamburg. While there, he and his fiancee, Astrid Kutcher, cleared some administrative paperwork to enable the Beatles to return to the city to perform. The Beatles had left Hamburg under a cloud in late 1960, after George Harrison was deported for being underage, and Paul McCartney and Pete Best were arrested for alleged arson. Sutcliffe and Kircher paved the way for the group's longest Hamburg residency, 92 nights at the Top Ten Club, which began on April 1, 1961. But first, there was a long train and boat journey from Liverpool to Germany, which began on the 27th of March. The Top Ten Club was owned by Peter Elkhorn, who paid each of the Beatles 35 Deutschmarks, three pounds per day. They were required to play from 7 p.m. until 2 a.m. each weekday, and from 8 p.m. until 4 a.m. on weekends, with a 15-minute break in each hour. 
The performances at the top 10 were so successful that Elkhorn twice extended the Beatles contract. They eventually left Germany following their final show at the club on July 1st, 1961, having performed on stage for 503 hours during their stay. On Thursday, the 22nd of June, the Beatles, under the name Toadie Sheraton and the Beat Brothers, recorded their first single, My Bonnie. The Beatles had been approached by orchestral leader and Polydor agent Bert Kampfhart, who wanted them as the backing band for Sheridan. The recording was not done at a professional studio, but a converted stage at Hamburg's Frederick Ebert Hall. We started off in a, in a place called the Kaiser Keller, then we went to the top ten, and then uh, the, the Star Club happened. But we were all together right at the beginning in the, in the Kaiser Keller. Beatles as well, and many other groups, of course. The Beatles and Sheridan recorded four songs over two consecutive days. My Bonnie, The Saints, Why, and Cry for Shadow. The latter was an instrumental, whereas the others all featured Sheridan on vocals. Bye. 
me. Basically, we it. wanted to do rock and roll, you see, and the first thing my Bonnie we did was a, a hit in Germany, and of course it's still selling all around the world because of them, but then we should have followed it up with something really rocking. Well, it, it actually began, uh, well, I went to Hamburg to play at the Top Ten Club, and I went, in, went in, into the Top Ten Club following the Beatles, so they were finishing off their period of time. I, I'm not sure how long they were, they were playing there, but um, I went in there and I met Paul and John and George outside the top train club. They were packing their gear into a into a van, and um, they came over and introduced themselves because um, at that time um, they were. I was doing a regular TV show in England, um, Drum B and Oh Boy. And, these were regular TV shows that were every Saturday night. And um, unbeknownst to me that Paul, Paul McCartney, was a Little Richard fan, and I was kind of known as England's Little Richard. When the Beatles were billed in the very, very early days, I remember in 61 they were billed as just straight from Hamburg, because while they were trying to make a name for themselves, when they were going to play in Hamburg, they'd be in Hamburg for up to six weeks, two months at a time. They'd come back and their image was changing from jeans. They were going into the leather trousers and leather jackets and the hair was starting to come down. And a lot of the local people thought this band from Germany are fantastic. Don't they speak English well? They actually thought they were a German band. And um, the Beatles from Germany was the way they were getting billed all the time. And of course from the Silver Beatles, then changed to the Beatles. But the local people just adored them some way because the Beatles were trying to be different. And I think uh, Liverpool, even right up to this day, people, uh, people in Liverpool love, love you if you, you don't follow any trends, if you want to try and be your own style. And um, the Beatles just didn't follow any trends. While everyone was trying to be Cliff Richard or Elvis, they just wanted to be the Beatles and play hard rock and roll. That was it. They were playing at Latham Hall, which is the Brian Kelly show. And after the show, they'd been the girls had been eyeing the Beatles up, which they always did, you know. And one or two of them were eyeing Stuart up because he was so shy, you know. And this gang, the girlfriend, the boyfriends of the girls, you know, followed the band outside. And one of them attacked Stuart, knocked him over and kicked him in the head. John came running out and hit, hit him to follow that hard. John couldn't bear a guitar for two weeks. They sprained his wrist, you know. And that was one of the few times I got, I wasn't there. I got told by one of the people who followed the band around a lot. And he said, uh, John was crying that night. Well, I've, I firmly believe that's where Stuart got his tumor from. It didn't come out till probably two years later, you know. Thursday, the 6th of July, sees the launch of the Mercy Beat magazine. Bill Harry, a student at the Liverpool College of Art, published the first edition of Mercy Beat magazine. The fortnightly magazine quickly became an essential read for fans of the Liverpool music scene. The Beatles appeared numerous times in its pages. Harry, a friend to John Lennon and Stuart Sutcliffe, was a keen writer. However, his attempts to interest the national press in the burgeoning Liverpool music scene came to nothing. Saturday, the 28th of October, Raymond Jones walks into NEMS record shop and orders my Bonnie. NEMS was owned by entrepreneur Brian Epstein. It is unlikely that Epstein had never heard of the Beatles until he met with Jones. The group was regularly featured in the Liverpudlian music publication Mercy Beat, which Epstein sold in NEMS and wrote record reviews for. Although he had little interest in the actual content, he could hardly have failed to notice the leather-clad group which had taken Hamburg by storm. Epstein's curiosity was nonetheless piqued after his encounter with the enthusiastic Jones. And on Thursday, the 9th of November, 1961, he and Taylor paid their first visit to the Cavern Club to watch the Beatles perform. It was the beginning of a chain of events that would irrevocably change the lives of the people involved and cause a revolution in popular culture. Epstein and Taylor entered the band's dressing room, which was only as big as a broom cupboard after the show. 
The Beatles recognized Epstein, with George Harrison opening the conversation by asking, And what brings Mr. Epstein here? Epstein watched the Beatles at the Cavern Club several times over the next few weeks. On the 10th of December, he suggested becoming the band's manager. They signed a five-year management contract on the 24th of January in 1962. On the evening of the 9th in November, however, the Beatles performed for the final time at Liverpool's slightly down-at-heel Leatherland Town Hall Ballroom. Monday, January 1st, 1962, was the date that the Beatles auditioned for Decca Records. The session followed the label's A&R representative, Mike Smith's attendance at a Cavern performance on the 13th of December. The Beatles' performance that night hadn't been strong enough to secure them a record deal, but the label was willing to offer them a session in their studios at 165 Broadhurst Gardens, West Hampstead, London. 